Hi everyone. I, we're just about to start up again. Um, we will be trying to achieve something now uh, when you find your seat and we could start um, the next talk. We will try the following. We, we will try to be finished at 3 o'clock sharp. We don't believe it will happen, but it's quite important. It's in your own self-interest to be done at 3 o'clock, because that means you could take the bus which leaves 15, 22, for those of you who want to catch that bus. Um, so hopefully we will be able now to do the rest in one session and finish at 3 o'clock. Dawn, this is your next talk. Thank you. In this presentation, um, I'm going to share with you uh, a focus around shared decision making uh, using patient decision aids. And I in, have a research chair in knowledge translation to patients. And within this role, I'm the scientific director of the patient decision aid research group. And I inherited this from Annette O'Connor. And so much of the research that I do is, is a continuation of some of the work that she's initiated in Ottawa. Oh. So as I'm just bringing up this uh, image again, I'm going to be focused actually in this upper corner here in this uh, second presentation. So in the presentation, I'll start with defining shared decision making, which was actually defined this morning. I'll talk about the interventions to engage patients in decision making and then talk about implementation. So the definition of shared decision making that I like to uh, use is it's a process by which a healthcare choice is made between the patient and one or more healthcare professionals. And the key word underlined is ch process. So it's really about not just a moment, but really what's that process by which patients are engaged in decision making. And th the other piece of this is that process piece around what is shared decision making. So in shared decision making, the number one first step in the process is that you need to be explicit around what's the decision being made. And so we have from research, multiple studies done around the world, that 50% of the time, the patient didn't even know a decision was being made. And so the first step is, is we need to be clear about what is the decision and what are the options that the patient has. Uh, the next step in the process is really information exchange and on the options, benefits, and harms, or the pros and the cons. And the reason I put in here exchange is because many patients that come into the clinical consultation come with their own ideas around what the options are. And so we really need to think that it's not just about me as a healthcare professional telling you what I think your options are and what are the benefits and harms, but it should be more of an exchange. We should ask, what is your understanding of the options? What is your understanding around the benefits and harms? And having a more of an exchange around this discussion. The third step in this process is really critical to shared decision making is values and preferences of the patient. And so we think about what are the values the patient has for the outcomes of options, or another way to think about it is what's really important to you. What are your concerns? What are your goals? And so it's really trying to look at here's the facts with the information around benefits, harms and of the options. And on the other side, it's the patient's personal circumstances and what's important to them. And what we need to think about is how do we bring these two pieces together so that we can actually um, reach a decision that's actually a nice fit for the patient in their own personal circumstances. In this model of shared decision making, we also have added in the, the into our process a step around feasibility. And so, Norway is not a lot different than Canada in that we have a huge diversity with population concentrations in certain areas and huge amounts of area where people travel a long way for treatment. And so for some people, their options are going to be more limited by where they live and whether or not they're willing to travel for treatment. Reaching a preferred choice, the actual choice, and then what gets implemented. Uh, Kaiser and Orbach did a review in 2006 and Hibbert and Green in 2013. And in these reviews, what they found was that patients involved in decision making have better quality of life, sense of control over their illness, and symptom relief. They have less fatigue, less depression, and less illness concerns. 
But consistently, and even though, especially the Kaiser and Or Orbach is old, it's now 10 years old, even studies published in 2016, 2015 say patients want to have a more active uh, role in decision making th than they're actually given. Nicholas Quet did a systematic review um, that was published in 2014, and they looked at the 33 studies that use the option instrument to measure shared decision making. And the average score was 23 out of 100. And the conclusions were shared decision making is not happening in clinical practice. Natalie Joseph Williams then did a nice study that was done looking at what patients perceive as their barriers and facilitators to them being involved in shared decision making. In this study, she identified 40, or in this systematic review, she identified 44 studies. And what she found is their patients' individual capacity to participate in shared decision making depended on knowledge about their disease, condition, options, outcomes and knowledge about their personal values and preferences. So really those two pieces that I talked about that are critical in shared decision making. But they also said the other big problem is this power imbalance. Um, they perceived the influence on decision making encounter um, would be enhanced if they were given permission to participate, if they felt more confident in their own knowledge and they had self-efficacy in using shared decision making skills. I don't know if I have the next slide. Sometimes, oh, the next slide that I sometimes have is that when the patients were asked, how can you actually overcome this? They actually identified that they needed healthcare professionals that would help them understand and would advocate for them. They actually never believed that you can actually deal with that power imbalance. So they picked the nurse, or it could be a physiotherapist, it could be a psychologist, that would actually advocate and help share their preferences into the uh, medical encounter part of the system. So in terms of interventions, I'm gonna talk about patient decision aids and decision coaching. So patient decision aids are adjuncts to counseling that provide information around the facts, around the options, benefits, harms. Many of them also communicate probabilities or what's the chances of a benefit or chances of a harm occurring. Um, they help patients clarify their values by asking them which benefits and harms matter most or sharing patients' experiences. And they support patients in decision-making by guiding them in the steps, how to think through the decision or how to communicate what's important to them. Some decision aids provide worksheets and or lists of questions. So if you look at the knowledge to action framework, patient decision aids really fit here in that center funnel as a knowledge tool. And so I'm gonna be referring to decision aids as a synthesis, based on a synthesis of knowledge and produced into a tool that could then be used by patients to be involved in decision making. Patient decision aids come in, uh, can be used either before the consultation or there's also decision aids that are used within the consultation and they come in printed form, DVD or video and online or computer based or some combination actually of multiple routes of uh, dissemination. So the original Cochrane Review was published in 1999 on patient decision aids. And at that time, there were 17 randomized control trials in the original publication. And in our um, last publication that was done in 2014, there was 115 trials. And right now, we're up to 131 trials in the current update of this review. In um, 2015, we actually established the International Patient Decision Aid Standards um, collaboration to try and look at what is the quality of patient decision aids and how can we set quality standards around this. In the 115 trials in the last update, you can see from this list is there's a huge range of different topics of patient decision aids around medication topics, um, screening topics, surgery topics, obstetrics topics, and other. And actually, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think any of the 115 trials have been conducted in Norway. But where's Simone? Have there been any done in Norway? RCTs? No. So in order to be included in the Cochrane Review of Patient Decision Aids, it needs to have been uh, evaluated in a randomized control trial to be included. Um, and there's a number of different studies on these topics. but. Um, 
uh, in, but none have been done in Norway. What are the results showing us? Well, compared to usual care, we know that patient decision aids improve um, decision quality, that there's 13% uh, higher knowledge, 82% more accurate risk perception, 51% better match between the values and the choice. And I've actually in incorporated in here the grade quality ratings around the evidence so that you can see where we've got really high quality evidence around uh, higher knowledge and where we've got lower quality or um, around the better match between values and choice, mostly because this has, has not been evaluated very well. It's much more difficult to value uh, this composite score of decision quality than it is to just test patients' knowledge. Um, decision aids reduce deci decisional conflict, particularly in the subscales of uninformed and unclear values. Um, it helps the undecided decide. In my presentation this morning, I talked about the 34% less passive in decisions. Um, it improves the patient-practitioner communication in seven out of eight trials. In the eighth trial, there was no difference between groups. And we also know that there's a potential to reduce overuse of surgery, uh, prostate-specific antigen testing, and hormone replacement therapy. Marianne Duran did a review of 19 studies that were con showed that um, there's significantly better outcomes in disadvantaged populations. And it may be more beneficial to disadvantaged patients than those with higher literacy or socioeconomic status. Because one of the barriers when we've come to implementing decision aids is that the, the physicians or the healthcare professionals will say, oh, it's not relevant to that patient. They don't have high enough literacy to use a decision aid with that patient. And so, but in the studies that have been actually conducted with lower literate populations, we actually see much higher gains in knowledge in that group than we do in the more moderate socioeconomic status. So as I mentioned, the International Patient Decision Aid Standards Collaboration was established um, in 2003. And our goal at that time was to enhance the quality and effectiveness of patient decision aids by establishing a shared evidence-informed framework for improving their content, development, implementation, and evaluation. And so currently I'm leading the International Committee with Glenn Elwin, who's at Dartmouth College in the U.S., and there's representatives from uh, many different countries. In the first uh, iteration, uh, we call ourselves IPDAS, so an acronym that I'm going to use, but it's for International Patient Decision Aid Standards. So we first of all created a checklist where you can just look at ticking the box on 86 items around quality of decision aids. Then we move forward an instrument where it was evaluated on a scale of one to four around how well was it done. So was it just sort of not, was not done at all or barely done or is it done to the highest standard around meeting that? And we cut down and had a shorter list of um, items that went forward for the instrument. In uh, 2013, 2014, we published minimal standards because in the beginning we thought we're really pushing forward the gold standard, like the best of decision aids. And we had to think about what would be minimal standards, what's the bar that you would need to reach to be able to then say it's adequate for exposing patients to this decision aid. And so at that time, we separated the criteria into three levels. One is what qualifies it to meet the definition of a decision aid. The second was what would we say minimally has to be done to actually certify it as a decision aid. And then we put all the rest of the criteria into quality criteria for higher quality um, decision aid. In 2013, we updated the evidence underlying the IPDAS checklist, and we created a supplement in BMC Medical Informatics and Decision Making with a series of um, 14 or 15 chapters. And then in 2014, we're now moving forward, well, since 2014 actually, we're moving forward reporting guidelines. So we're expecting to submit that paper later this year. So if you want to find a patient decision aid, if you just Google decision aid, um, you can then come to our website in Ottawa where we actually host the international inventory of decision aids. Um, and you type in a topic and you can actually find out what decision aids are available on that topic. There's one other inventory that Pipe Stallmeyer leads in the um, Netherlands, and in the Netherlands, you can go in by language, and so it allows much more language options, but in the end, he links mostly over to our inventory um, that, that 
you enter in by English primarily. Once you open up the website, the, the page, if you click on uh, one of the links below and you open it up, you actually get a summary of the decision aid and you can actually in the middle, you can link to get access to it. And then you can also see how it rates on the international patient decision aid standards checklist. In terms of decision coaching, it's another intervention for facilitating patient engagement in health decisions. It's when a trained healthcare professional who's non-directive and provides support that aims to develop patient skills in thinking about the options, preparing for discussing the decision in a clinical consultation, and implementing the chosen option. This intervention is done face-to-face -face or using the telephone. Uh, one of the tools that's available um, for decision coaching and decision coach training is we use the Ottawa Personal Decision Guide. And so after many years of developing and evaluating um, patient decision aids in Ottawa in randomized control trials, we always had a worksheet in our decision aids. And what we did is we took all the specifics of the decision out of our worksheets and we created what we call a generic approach to um, processing the decision. And so in this decision aid, you start by identifying the decision, you look at what are the options, the benefits and the harms of the options. And then we also have a section around support to look at who else is involved in the decision making. We also have a Ottawa personal decision guide for two, um, where you can actually have two different perspectives, person one, person two. So one of the projects we have on the go is with children making decisions with their parents. And so the child actually gets to rate their priorities first and then the parent after the child is used it. Um, on this back page, it's two pages, this document, you can actually assess your decision making needs after you've gone through the front page to figure out um, where, how you would rate yourself around, do you feel that you know the options? Are you clear about what matters most? Do you have enough support and advice and do you feel certain? And then the next steps based on your needs at this point. So we call this the SURE test. It's the floor item version of the decisional conflict scale that's been designed for use in clinical practice. We did a, system, a systematic review evaluating decision coaching used in trials of patient decision aids. And what we found in the 10 trials that have used it is that it improved knowledge compared to usual care. It improved knowledge similar to the decision aid. So if they're randomized to decision coaching versus a decision aid, they were both similarly improved. And it either improved or showed no difference on the other outcomes around values, choice agreement, satisfaction, participation, and costs. So in terms of implementation and what's happening at the health policy level, um, we have actual health policies requiring shared decision making in a number of different countries. Um, and so in Canada, it's one province out of 12. At, and you can see here where the actions of 2010 to 11 were to develop and implement a shared decision making framework. This came from a study that was done of the public where they said to the public, how can we improve our health system? And they said, we want to be more involved in health decisions. And so this is what pushed this government to um, putting it on the top of their agenda around better improving uh, shared decision making for, parent, for patients. Um, in the UK in 2010, they also brought in shared decision making under their policy around improving patient safety. And so in this time, it was really focused around how do we engage patients to be part of how decisions get made, because therefore we'll have a safer environment, less uh, negative outcomes. And in 2010 also, the Obamacare legislation in the US came in and on page 1106, there's a section on shared decision making. Um, there's no funding was tied to this part of the legislation and it's not the legislation we hear very much controversy about because what we hear about is op uh, public access to healthcare services or um, more open access. And so this piece sort of gets lost in that legislation. In Washington state, one of the states in the US, they actually in 2007 brought in a revised legislation around informed consent. And what they brought in is that there's a requirement for shared decision making for all elective surgical procedures. And they also suggest the use of a patient decision aid as evidence that shared decision making occurred. 
Part of this legislation required use of a certified patient decision aid. And so in May of 2015, last year, um, they actually set up a think tank around what would certification look like, and over the last year developed a certification program for this state, which was launched in April of this year to start certifying patient decision aids. And this week, and I'm missing it by being here in Washington, D.C., they're actually moving forward certification at a na national level, and the meetings are how do we actually certify patient decision aids uh, in the U.S. In the Netherlands, um, their whole patient decision aids and shared decision making has come under the guise of um, patient, empowering patients to be important partners uh, in their health care and also linked into accreditation. And so when you look at the accreditation standards, the standards talk about um, patients being able to make care decisions. Um, and participate in care decisions and, and that decisions are made based on their values and preferences. And so it's really about how do we move this then into practice. Oh, and Australia, I think this is my last slide for my country. Um, their whole area of interest in shared decision making is under their health literacy framework. And they, their definitions of health literacy is that consumers can obtain, understand, and use health information to make decisions. And that we as healthcare professionals and service provide information and interactions to help improve their health literacy. So in terms of implementation, France Le Carré in, in um, Quebec City in Canada, she, le she leads the Cochrane Review on interventions for improving adoption of shared decision making. And what we found of the 39 studies included in the last review is that shared decision making can be learned Healthcare professionals need training, and we need to combine that with patient-mediated interventions such as patient decision aids. And the other p big piece of this that we learned is that you can't just target one group or the other. You really need to be targeting both the healthcare team and the patients with different types of interventions. So in terms of training, uh, on our website in Ottawa, we have information about the interprofessional shared decision-making training. We have an online tutorial that's about an hour and 30 minutes to do, and it's open access, and anyone can go on and do it. Um, and then we combine that with a three-and-a-half-hour skills-building workshop where we use the um, decision support analysis tool for self-appraising skills. We use the Ottawa Personal Decision Guide that I showed you, and we often also use a video vignette that demonstrates uh, shared decision making. So in terms of the implementation studies that I've been involved in, I've actually been involved in a number, but I wanted to give you three examples. So the first one is around location of care for frail elderly, whether to continue living at home or to move into some kind of care facility. The second study is around use of insulin pump in children with type 1 diabetes. And the third study is around prostate cancer treatment. And so in all of our studies, um, I've identified the setting. The provincial health system, so in Canada, each of our provinces has a separate health system. And so we're looking also about how it works across health systems. In terms of decision coaching, in uh, the location of care, in home care, it's a social worker. And in our... Um, Diabetes clinic for children, it's actually the social worker as well. And in the prostate clinic, it's the nurse that's doing decision coaching. In terms of the clinical team, all of our teams, we work with a whole interprofessional team. We don't work with just one healthcare professional, but we actually do training with the whole team. Um, in terms of the patient decision aid, we had to create a new one for this project because there wasn't one that was specific to this decision in Quebec, where they have different criteria for qualifying for different levels of care. In the uh, diabetes one, we use the Ottawa Personal Decision Guide for two, and we populated it with the evidence from a clinical practice guideline because there are almost no patient decision aids for children, and we wanted to be able to use uh, a, create a decision aid quickly for children. And for the um, prostate study we've, project, we've used the Informed Medical Decisions Foundation. It came with a video and a booklet, and part of the reason we chose that decision aid, or the team did, is because they wanted the video to access uh, lower literate populations and help them understand better the options. And then the training was the same training we provided in all three of our teams. The other piece in terms of measures and reports is that we use the SURE test, the four-item SURE test in all of our studies, as a way of measuring in clinical practice how well have we done in terms of helping engage the patient in understanding their options. We 
If we can, we add a values clarification exercise. Uh, in these two studies, um, it was part of the decision aid. In this study, we actually used an instrument that's available called the decision quality instrument. And there's about a number of different instruments on some of the pro topics. Oh, I, I switched over to knee, sorry. I, my previous slide was about prostate, but the knee study actually used the same uh, type of approach as prostate. Um, role and dis knowledge, we use the knowledge test in this instrument. Role and in decision making, we measured quality of life. We used the frail severity measure, and we used WOMAC and hip knee priority tool. And we reported the findings using the decision aid in two studies, and in the third study, we used a patient preference report. And in this preference report, you can see at the top, we have the clinical priority from the patient perspective. Um, and how severe is their pain functional limitations. In the second scoring area, we have the healthcare professional, which is a general practitioner or a physiotherapist assessment. You can see where the patient scored fairly moderate in terms of severity of their osteoarthritis of the knee. And then we've also included the sure test results. Feel sure about the best choice, feels they know enough, feels clear about values, feels they have enough support and advice, and we map that with their actual knowledge scores on the um, test and their values for repeat reasons for surgery, reasons against surgery. You can see where this outweighs the reasons against surgery. So this report is created and given to the surgeons as part of the process of care. So in wrapping up, um, patient decision aids and decision coaching are effective decision support interventions for number one, making explicit the decision and enhancing patient understanding and guiding patients to use health information for making decisions. There's emerging evidence around implementation. We still have a long way to go um, that interventions need to target the interprofessional team and the patients. And we need to integrate these interventions into routine clinical practice and use measures to inform clinical practice. And so I'll stop on this slide where you have access to the website that we have in Ottawa, decisionaid.ohri.ca, where you can actually see we have a number of different tools around how to develop decision aids. And we have a um, training module in here, evaluation measures. You can actually get all the evaluation measures we've developed and also the implementation toolkit where you, you can also link to training in the Ottawa Decision Support Tutorial. And at the top actually is our decision aids. So you can go find out what of the 400 decision aids that are logged into the inventory are relevant to your topic. So I'll open it up for questions or comments. So I'm not aware of low cognitive function, but I know that in the group in um, uh, Baylor and MD Anderson in Texas, they've actually developed um, a series of decision aids for really low literate populations and Spanish populations. And they use um, a soap opera type format, a video, where they talk in the, the women in, with breast cancer talk in the change room while they're trying on dresses around their view and experience. And so they've tried, and tried to do a, a way of telling stories through like you would watch on TV as an approach to reach lower literate populations. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Don. Is this working? Yeah.
Schirm sieht man jetzt? Welchen Schirm sieht man jetzt? Okay. Also das sieht man. So, this is the, um, uh, the final uh, presentation today before the panel discussion. Very exciting final um, talk. We, we have had a lot of uh, very interesting talks today. And now, as you see, there are two of them. So, uh, it is Simone Kjellin um, and Jürgen Kasper. Jürgen Kasper is from the University of Tromsø, a professor there working with shared decision aids. While uh, Simone Kjellin is representing both uh, our health region, region uh, Helsesröst. And in addition, you are about to start a PhD or have started a PhD at the uh, University of Tromsø. I heard you the first time, Simona, uh, two, three years ago when you spoke at a conference about shared decision aids in Oslo. And you uh, talked about your own uh, experience as a patient in the Norwegian health system. And at the same time, now you are one of the health professionals in Norway that knows the most about uh, shared decision aids. So I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, and I have to say, I'm very pleased to have visiting from, from so far away. I was, um, the first time I met Don, um, and the only time until now, was um, in Sydney last summer. I was on the International Shared Decision Making and Evidence-Based Evidence -based Practice um, Conference in Sydney. And um, she's a big star in my eyes, you know. She has done so much on this research in this field, and we are very lucky to having them, all of them here. So it's very nice. Um, yeah, um, as Jan said, my background is um, nursing. I have recently finished a master's degree in health and empowerment. Um, in my master's thesis, I um, validated uh, the Norwegian version of a uh, measurement instrument to measure shared decision making in clinical encounters. And my supervisor was Jürgen Kasper. I was so lucky that he moved to Norway uh, about two years ago from Germany. Um, and he has done a lot of research in this field as well. As well. And um, now recently I um, started as a PhD um, candidate um, at um, UN um, Hospital of North Norway and the uh, UIT University. Um, of course, you can guess the topic. So, um, um, I also have to say that I work as an advisor um, on shared decision making in the, in the southeastern regional health authority in Norway, Helse Sørøst, um, where we have been working with shared decision making for a couple of years now, and I'm going to show you a bit of, of the work we have done, and Jürgen is going to show some of the work from North Norway. And now our two groups um, working with shared decision making has, um, for a couple of weeks ago, we we have made a marriage, so now we're one big group working with shared decision making in Norway. Okay, so um, there has been a lot of talk about shared decision making today. Um, and um, in Norway, only for a couple of years, we have had um, political support on this. Um, it's pretty new, shared decision making, the concept in Norway. Um, in Norway, in Norwegian, we call it Samvalg. And um, we know that inter from the international experience, we had a lot of, lot of different um, definitions. But in Norway, we wanted to start early to have one um, definition um, of shared decision making or Samvalg. So a group and, um, of researchers and clinicians working with shared decision making got together and we made this definition um, for shared decision making in Norway and it's implemented in the white paper um, 11 um, National Health or Sykehus Plan. So you can find it there. I don't think I have to read it, but then you know that we have one definition here. So we um, have a health minister who is um, very interested in shared decision making. And um, he, says, he says that he wants to change the fact that doctors take decision behalf on patients um, and without involving the patients in the decision. He also says the guiding principle should be no decision will made will made about me without me. The, we have heard this um, earlier today as well. So he is um, one of the polit politicians uh, really talking about sh shared decision making. And um, therefore, we also have 
have these four newly published white papers, um, all containing information about shared decision making and encouraging it to be implemented in the health system. Um, and we call it the patient's healthcare, um, patient's health system, health um, system. So, um, but we have not only um, been con uh, writing about shared decision making in the white papers, but also the user organizations, patients organizations, and the um, um, user representatives in the health regions are talking about shared decision making, and they're embracing it. Um, one of the user representatives working in our in health service in our health region, he is calling some vulg or shared decision making for his baby. He just loves it. He loves working with this. He wants to implement it, and he's also given um, given lectures about it so it's very nice to having the patients on board and there have also been um, writing about in the in the um, um, strategies for patient involvement um, in the patient um, user and user um, groups so that has been very very good and very helpful to having them on board um, one of the white papers here about um, here is also writing about a decision aid um, or a health system for um, bipolar disease. Um, and I've been so lucky that I've been um, a part of developing the system and I'm going to show it to you later. Um, this is for, from um, white paper 11. Um, but like in other countries, we also have um, have shared decision making as a patient right. It's actually um, the patient and user law is saying that um, the patients and users has, has right to participation and information, and that includes the patient's right to participate in choosing between available, appropriate examination and treatment options. And it should be adapted to the individual's ability to give and receive information. So we have it in the, in the law. Um, patient and user law, but the question is, are we doing it or not? Um, and recent studies show in Norway that we are not doing any more shared decision making here in Norway than the other um, studies show internationally. So we have a lot of work to do. So Jürgen, I'm going to give the word to you for a couple of minutes. I would summarize in contrary. Finally, Norway have uh, jumped on the train and is now joining this, uh, this big movement. And um, very impressive for me uh, as a German with my background of uh, 14 or 15 years uh, shared decision-making research in Germany. Um, I, I think it's, uh, it's really a dramatic uh, thing ongoing. And um, it's the most uh, surprising for me is that it's not just um, huge activity in research, you know, it's also, it, it looks like uh, real implementation and the will and the conditions and the emphasis and uh, uh, structures and um, um, uh, conditions that um, in, the, in this country that make it uh, likely that um, we will succeed with implementation of shared decision making. So this is quite um, interesting when I'm now um, visiting visit my friends and my colleagues in Germany and tell what's going on here uh, after so many years. Mm. Shared decision making, um, as we uh, learned before, is a good example for uh, knowledge, knowledge translation into action because there's uh, some uh, good evidence saying that uh, shared decision-making makes a difference on patient-relevant endpoints. And uh, shared decision-making might also be a, a strategy of translating knowledge into action. So this is quite, quite a good um, issue in this conference. Mm, we want now to, to guide you through a couple of issues. First, introduce our um, common approach and then um, give some practical examples of uh, what we develop. Mm. When, we, when we think shared decision making, um, first of all, we think the whole patient pathway. And I think this is quite important 
there are many decisions to make, many decisions made already by the patient autonomously, many decisions uh, to be made by the physicians, also decisions with no choice, with no options, and not all are relevant for shared decision making. We try to, to both localize the relevant decisions and address first of all and predominantly those uh, representing key, key decisions in a, in a patient uh, pathway. Um, next, we refer to a structure of a consultation. This structure is not it's quite logical. It's uh, it's nothing you would you wouldn't be um, able to uh, to develop yourself. But um, behind each of those steps, there are a couple of criteria um, we try to consider when we uh, consider when we teach uh, decision making when we train. Um, I take a. Um, a small course through the, the uh, consultation. Um, first of all, it's important that the patient realizes that there's a choice to make and why now. And where the patient is in this decision and in this diagnosis, which risk is uh, uh, about, which risk are we talking? Then it's important that both patient and the health professional find an agreement about that is the patient, the, up to the patient to, to, um, to consider importance of benefit and harms. Mm, if this doesn't happen, the whole information process, which is in the next uh, step, is just a, a nice service, but not, not really helpful to make a decision. So then there's the, cent the central part about the, the option information about the options. Um, there we have to consider the criteria. We, we already talked about that criteria of evidence-based patient information. Then uh, there comes a deliberation phase where the patient can express and discuss his or her concerns. And then a decision and the arrangements are not just about What's, what's the next step to do? It's ab also about what criteria do we agree on to ev evaluate our, our, uh, this, this decision in future. For example, if we meet one year later and uh, we try to, to evaluate this process. Um, shared decision making is uh, not existent in the most of the consultations we, we have the chance to look on. It, it's, it needs training. It's not um, going to be implemented by itself just because it's logical or many people have to hold this attitude. So we need strategies, so-called uh, decision support technologies, which can um, be addressed to uh, health professionals or to patients or structure, for example, uh, by changing the, the information or communication course. Um, or they can um, at, um, address um, the, the patient before the consultation or the health professional or during or independent, like, for example, uh, communication training. And so we can classify all those strategies. And what we know is, like Don already said, um, that those strategies should be um, combined. One strategy, just a decision aid, for example, doesn't help. We need uh, interventions on the other side, for example, the training, addressing the health professionals. And this is what we try to do. But another issue um, characterizing our approach is that we we understand those interventions, those interventions as as complex interventions, and try to consider all those criteria and frameworks um, that make complex interventions work. 
the, the, the framework of development and evaluation of complex intervention, the IPTAS criteria, and um, yeah, mainly those. So I don't plan to discuss with you each of those, those pieces of this cake, but um, I want to show them the most important criteria we, we try to consider. We include patients in many ways in the development process, when we adjust the didactics, when we, uh, when we um, uh, study the needs, when we pilot our tools, patients are with in the, in the uh, project team. And uh, the other user group, the health professionals, need to be included very early from the first day, as we heard today from um, Ingram. Our contents are, of course, are evidence-based, and evidence-based are the, as far as possible, the methods we use for presentation. For example, um, figures to present, uh, to, uh, to explain uh, numbers uh, of benefit and numbers of harms. We predefined our goals in terms of oper operationalized endpoints. We have an evaluation strategy and a strategy to implement. Our theory is, our, our didactic is theory based. We, we use the theory of plant behavior. So this, to give a short uh, introduction into our uh, approach. Okay, then I will take over again, and now I'm going to show you um, the, the health um, Norwegian decision support system I've been working on, um, and I'm trying to show you a short movie. Let's see if this goes well. I'm sorry it's Norwegian, but I think you can understand it um, with the pictures. Let me see here. No, it doesn't work. Som pasienter er det ikke alltid vi forstår det legen sier, eller har nok kunnskap om de ulike behandlingsalternativer. For hver sykdom og diagnose finnes det ofte flere behandlinger, og valgene du møter kan være både belastende og vanskelige. Hvilke behandlingsalternativer finnes? Det kan være mellom ulike typer medikamenter, det kan være mellom om du skal operere eller trene og være mer fysisk aktiv. Noen ganger står valget mellom å ta en behandling eller la være. De kan sammenligne med det å skaffe seg en ny mobil. Er størrelsen mest viktig? Er det fargen som betyr mest? Eller er det lagringsplassen? Det er altså flere prioriteringer du må gjøre. Samvalg betyr at pasienten er med å ta beslutninger sammen med helsepersonell i den grad pasienten ønsker det. Sammen kan dere vurdere alle tilgjengelige behandlingsalternativer, finne ut hva du kan forvente av behandlingene, og veie fordeler og ulemper opp mot hverandre. Samvalgsverktøyet gir hjelp til dette samarbeidet. Hva betyr mest for deg i behandlingen? Er det å unngå smerter? Er det å unngå bivirkninger? Og hva tenker du om livskvalitet? Du kan velge ut de punktene som er viktige for deg, og si noe om hvor betydningsfulle de vil være i behandlingen. Ved å klikke deg inn på det enkelte punkt kan du lese mer om fordeler og ulemper som behandlingene innebærer. Samvalgsverktøyet hjelper deg å beklare over dine prioriteringer og rangere behandlingene ut fra det som du synes betyr mest. Du kan også sammenligne de ulike behandlingene på de områdene som er viktigst for deg. Verktøyet gir pasient og lege en felles forståelse av valgmulighetene, slik at de sammen kan bli enige om hvilken behandling som stemmer best med pasientens verdier og prioriteringer. Samvalg kan skape mer trygghet, mer involvering og et godt samarbeid mellom pasient og helsepersonell. So now I'm just going into, into the decision, decision support system live. And um, we are actually so lucky we have it on English as well. So that's very good for today. Um, now I'm logging in as a fake person. Um, so you can see the system. I have been here. So now you have to think I'm not the, f this is not the first time I use the system. So if you're the first time in, in the, in the instrument, it looks a little bit different. 
because if you go into the system the first time, you will um, you will go through a couple of um, okay. I'm, I've jumped over something, so I'm going back a little bit. It's called the site treatment. Um, it's a complete health optimization system. Um, so it's, I'm going very short through this. It's a web-based platform. It has an app um, and an author suite for developing decision aids and um, one per condition. Um, um, it can be a decision aids, clinical support system, monitoring, self-help and empowerment system, and a communication system you can develop inside this platform. Um, and for whom? It's for patients, it's for clinicians, caregivers, and healthcare organizations. Um, yeah, so for one-time uh, one decisions um, or for repeated decision, ongoing or ongoing treatment, like bipolar disease, which I'm going to show you very soon. Um, yeah, and also follow-up follow -up treatment. So the starting point is, of course, what's the best treatment for me? Um, because some of the criteria from this patient is that she wants to stay out of the hospital, she wants to keep her work, and she wants to avoid side effects. So the bad news are that it's impossible for any human brain to, to process all this knowledge of the best available evidence and her criteria, her values and preferences, and provide uh, an answer for one best treatment for this person. Um, and no current, current Norwegian system, at least, provides all this knowledge and support in one tool. Um, so that the result is that um, treatment is rarely optimal. Um, it could mean hospitalization for this patient. She can be um, work absence due to illness, for example. So, but support is on its way, and it's the decision um, tool we have developed now. Um, it's not released yet, but I hopefully in the in the fall we're going to re release the system in um, health service and national also. Um, so first, the patient goes through a questionnaire. Um, to, um, to specialize the decision aid for this one patient who's going through it. Um, he can read about the disorder, the decision. Um, he has a questionnaire where he's asked a few questions to, to, um, to make it more fit for this one person going through the system. So now I'm just switching and I'm going to show you. Let me see if I can hear. I'm going inside the system. Okay, now I'm in here as Maria Olsen. Um, first, we have an introduction page with a lot of information for the patient about um, what, kind of, um, what kind of decision has to be made, why do we have to make a decision, about what's shared decision making, and so on and so on. A lot of um, information. And then we have the, um, this is the introduction page, and then we have the best option page, and this is a, uh, um, one of the core features in this um, system. Here, the patient can say, this is for bipolar disease and long-term treatment for bipolar disease. The patient can say, how important is it to avoid um, periods with severe um, mania? This is very important. The person, maybe it's not so relevant for this, um, for this patient and so on. He can he, um, just prioritize what is important for you. And if you are um, unsure what does avoid side effects mean, then of course you can just click on it and you have a lot of more um, information under each um, link here. So uh, like you have probably you saw, when I ch change this, then the treatment options here change as well. So the system um, um, based on the multi criteria decision analysis and um, utility um, form, it um, calculates what's the best treatment for this patient based on the newest, um, the newest evidence. This is a network's meta-analysis um, from 2013. And um, here, of course, calculating also what's important for the patient. And here we have the different, different treatment options, like the lithium is one of them. It's also possible to compare two different um, options against each other and see how well they're doing on the criteria the patient has set here. Um, and of course, we have um, the knowledge base, the matrix in the bottom with all the different medications and all the, all the different criteria. So, but the, this, is, um, this is how the one-term decision looks as well. 
It could be breast cancer or lung cancer standing here with two or three different options, but we also have a long-term um, treatment, and this is the one I'm showing you now for bipolar disease. And here, um, we have a lot, lot bigger system. So as you can see here, a little notification came. I have the same one on my phone, on the app. On the app. And here, did you take your treatment today? Um, yes, it was taken. And um, then, did you do your fitness today? Or maybe the patient was jogging tomorrow morning, 60 minutes. And um, now we can see here, already the patient has taken its medication. So here we can see the actual use or the compliance to the medication. And here we have the treatment plan. And um, down here we have how I'm doing for the patient. Um, we can measure this. You can be asked um, here on your app as well, or you can enter it here on the computer, how you're doing. And um, you can go back and, and see the picture, how you are doing to the criteria we see here, how you're doing avoiding manic um, symptoms. And of course, the doctor um, or the decision nurse, um, they can see the same picture and they can monitor how the patients are doing. The patient can also enter events. Um, like here, I think the patient entered something this morning. He went to a knowledge translation conference. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, yeah, and the patient can put in all the things that's important um, for him, for himself and important that the doctor knows. Um, so, and of course, we can monitor sleep. Here we entered, you can enter your sleep and fitness and so on. So this is the, this is a part of the long-term decisions. Um, so it could be diabetes, it could be um, obstructive lungs, um, lung um, disease, it could be all kind of um, different decision for long-term use and long-term decisions. Um, yeah, I think I'm, we have about short of time, so I'm going to go um, back into the presentation. And if you have some questions about the system, you can just ask me later. Um, so then we will go back here. So it's going a little bit slow. Yeah, so this, um, the app looks like this. You're getting a notification. Have you taken a treatment today? And you can click off the app and it's going straight to the system. Um, letting the health prof professional know that you have taken your medication if you want to share your system because of course it's the patient system and the patient who can invite in the health professional, the clinicians, the decision nurses, or of course also um, if you want to invite family to your system, that's possible as well. So then um, for the patient, all core features of patient-centered care is integrated in one service. I found the, the little movie we saw earlier today was like a very good intro um, to this health system. So that's what the Danish movie was very nice, I think. Um, for the clinician, it's powerful support for selecting and optimizing treatment. So it's possible to find the best treatment, to optimize it over time, and to let the patients benefit from each other's experience as well. Then, Jürgen, it's your time to present Mine Behandlingsvalg. Okay, at the um, uh, medical um, hospital in northern Norway, um, we developed at the same time uh, a platform called Mine Behandlingsvalg, my uh, treatment choice. Uh, which was uh, uh, which went public uh, in December uh, last year, and this um, the special thing in this platform is that we uh, tried now there are just five decision aids um, that we um, uh, developed a, um, a template which can be used to produce more and more effective. And this template does not just refer to, to the design, but also to, to the development process, including the implementation from the first day. And uh, this is called the DA factory. This is also the name of my research project. Mm, when we um, uh, presented our platform, we, we got a lot of support and uh, positive feedback all over Norway, and uh, very importantly, uh, much more uh, money to, to continue with our work. 
So this is great, and um, then we get, uh, were in, um, invited to um, to move our platform on the central Norwegian platform, Helsinki.no, and this is this is quite important for us. I will show you now. Um, I hope I is it open in the background. I'll give you some insight into mini um, behandlingswerk, and I. Do we have some more minutes? We are running out of time. So this this um, landing page is going to uh, to change. Ah, here, been here. Here, here. Ah, da, okay, it's going to change, and we we, we now um, we are now um, adjusting the whole instrument with uh, design to make it fitting into the Helsinki.no. But the structure is uh, the same, and this is uh, you can visit this site. So if I now go into the, the prostata tool and there in the low risk tool, then you see four components and the first component, and this is rigorously related to the, to the structure I, I showed you before. First, it's about understanding what is the problem, why do I have to make a choice and why now, and uh, what is my personal situation here, my risk as far as uh, this can be said, what is, uh, what is uh, the conflict here? What, what do I have to decide on? And why do I have, uh, why should I be with? What is my, why should I, why, why cannot the, the physician decide in my place? And there we, we use for, to motivate the patients uh, visiting the uh, decision aid, we use authentic patients explaining and talking about their own decision process without telling what they choose. So just just uh, about uh, their experiences with making a choice and with making a choice together with the health professionals. And then um, the options, and you see we, we present the options balanced uh, beside of each other, and in each option we answer six questions. For example, the, the benefit of doing um, prostatectomy in prostate cancer is, whoops, yeah, is this that after 15 years you can expect um, 13 of uh, 100 who had this uh, prostatectomy um, to survive because of the treatment, while 32 wouldn't survive uh, anyway, and 55 wouldn't have needed this treatment. Oh, and then there's a summary um, in the same structure, very short, and um, a couple of tools helping the patient to reflect on, on uh, preferences. Back to the presentation. The last few minutes about training. We are aware of the the need for uh, maybe just uh, the need for additional training. Um, we know if we explain shared decision making to the physicians, most of them say, "Yeah, we are doing this already." But the the, the reality is they do not, or in, in a little extent, to little extent. But this does not say they have, they don't want to. And um, I am um, developed a taxonomy of uh, types of barriers to uh, shared decision making, and this is helpful to to develop training didactic. For example, there are those. Uh, consultations where there's no decision to see because there, there's a patient coming into the consultation with a strong preference. So they just decide. And the, the choice is already made before, and they agree in this uh, perception. Or the, the physician tries to show there's a decision to make and explains the options, but the patient is not involved, it's passive. Or the doctor tries to involve the patient, but doesn't succeed because he's not able to present the information the right way. Okay, uh, next. 
I developed in a German group a training, a very effective training called Dr. Mit SDM. The doctor needs just two times 15 minutes for an intensive face-to-face -face video feedback um, with, with um, feedback uh, on a consultation, on own consultation, which has been analyzed using a shared decision-making observation uh, scale. Um, and we were able to change the communication quality uh, significantly with this training and use this training and this, amongst other components, this for a new, new approach we now try to, to implement in, in Norway. Maybe you can explain yeah, because it's your uh, two PhD words about that. Um, we call this um, framework um, ready to STM or Cloud for Samvalg. And we are just in the start um, of developing it. It's a part of my PhD. Um, and we want to develop um, a, a training for health professionals um, in shared decision making because we don't have any of this in Norway yet. Um, we have no structured training for any health professionals in shared decision making. We don't have it for uh, medical students or nursing students either. Um, so we have to do something about that in Norway and uh, hopefully we can, we can do something. Um, so we are starting to develop it and it will be um, capable of to, to adjust it to different targets group like um, for, um, for listlege, also doctors in specialization or for medical students um, and also in different settings um, like in a couple of hour training or we have a, a lot more time so it will be able to adjust it to which kind of setting we are, we are having. So I think we have to, to wrap up now, but thank you very much. And just come and ask us questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're not done yet, are we? We still have a very, very interesting session. The final one. Yeah. Like this? Okay. So, um, Jenny will lead this uh, session. You want to introduce the um, panel participants? Yeah. All right, everyone. Um, thanks to all of the speakers today. We had a really uh, great day hearing a little bit about knowledge translation, user engagement, and patient decision needs, and shared decision making. So. Um, I've learned a lot. Thank you guys for participating. Uh, this, for the last part of this session, we're wrapping this up with a panel discussion on the status of knowledge translation in Norway. We have a couple of uh, panelists that are coming up. Um, we have Stierce Stoki, who is at the University, at Oslo University Hospital, and you heard from her a little bit earlier. Uh, Rando Wegoas, who is teaching a course on knowledge translation at uh, the University College of Oslo. And we have Hilda Tenderholt Merhag, I'm not sure if I got that one right, I'm sorry if I didn't, um, who is from the Norwegian Knowledge Center. And then Jan, who is presenting from the um, Regional Center for Knowledge Translation and Rehabilitation. So if you're speaking, if you're a panelist, please come on up. Um, I've asked for each of these individuals to um, provide a brief overview of um, the, w their perspective of the current status of knowledge translation in Norway, and to talk a little bit about how each of their initiatives 
is contributing to knowledge translation and identify any gaps that we need to start thinking about and working on to help improve knowledge translation in Norway. So each person is going to be talking for um, about five minutes and then we want to open it up for um, any questions and we'd love to have a great discussion about your perception of knowledge translation and anything that um, you have questions about from today. All right, who would like to start? Jag vill testa den här. Den mikrofonen virker, men måste snacka rätt in i den flata och lite högt. Ska jag starta? Gärna det. Gärna det. Okej. Okay. Anja, um, skicka in. Well, I made some notes for um, my little speech here. Um, well, I think that very much has happened in Norway when it comes to EBP and uh, KT over the years that we have been uh, working with it. Um, when we started up, we had many fundamental uh, discussions about what EBP and KT is, while now we discuss uh, more how to do it in the best possible way. Um, the Center for Evidence-Based Practice at the University College of Bergen and uh, the no, uh, Knowledge Center of the um, Health Services has been a spearhead to seat EBP and KT on the map in Norway. Um, access to literature is uh, seen as an important initiative for implementing EBP. As it has been said earlier today, health workers in Norway have free, free internet at work and free access to scientific uh, articles via health uh, uh, via Norwegian Electronic Health uh, li uh, Library. <laughs> the health library is very important due to EBP. Um, Hospital in Lana, Bergen, and uh, we, uh, on our way, have shown how to achieve this in, this in practice, and many have followed us. Um, a great uh, progress is uh, that most bachelor studies in health education has now uh, models and uh, lessons in EBP, expertise in the EBP and uh, KT is uh, vital. Um, unfortunately, uh, there are still some who call their work evidence-based, um, when I sometimes call it cow cowboy-based. Um, it is important that we do this work systematically and follow the method. Um, and then we need staff uh, that um, today, I think, at least uh, need uh, a post-professional program in EBP um, to provide health professionals with skills to better use research evidence and enhance evidence-based decision-making within their own clinical practice. I have collaborated with uh, College University in Oslo, Akershus, Bergen and Olsen and have seen a tremendous development in uh, terms of both attitudes and skills in EBP. I think we have much to gain from uh, uh, coordinating this work and can structure it in um, the different health institutions and also in Norway. Um, here, uh, fagprocedure.no has done an amazing job. We are now cooperating crosswise the health authorities, hospitals and regions and are sharing now our documents. I believe that EBP is uh, appropriate for implementation in clinical practice and a must for quality and patient safety. Um, it is required to work towards evidence-based practice uh, then one must uh, be willing that it is resource intensive. Uh, if one calculates the staffing factor only in relation to the number of patients and or patient factors and do not take into account that one needs resources for prof professional development work and quality work as EBP is, I'm afraid we are not going to achieve the uh, rec recommendations of EBP or KT. But I am optimistic with uh, this exciting work that has been contributing to important patient care, uh, there is no way back uh, besides just 
go on and further developing the field. Thank you. Hello. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for, for having this opportunity to, um, to present some of the work that the Norwegian Knowledge Center have done. Uh, it's amazing to listen to all the work which has actually been done. I mean, a small group started with evidence-based medicine uh, or evidence-based practice in the end of 1990s around the uh, group of Andy Oxman. And today we are listening to the work of uh, HD and also we have the KT uh, movement that is going on at the University College of, of Oslo. Um, I think more or less we are sharing the same ecosystem. I think so, and I'm very optimistic. Um, we don't use the, the concept uh, uh, um, knowledge translation at the knowledge center. We use implementation, but it's more, from my point of view, is more or less the same. Um, at the knowledge center, we have uh, our our main work is actually to to write systematic reviews. So we are part of this uh, knowledge synthesis uh, process. Uh, we write. Um, uh, we also write um, K reports, like uh, the one that is recently published that was on the effect of clinical practice guidelines. We also participate in, eco, in uh, EPOC uh, reviews in Cochrane, and we also do health technology assessments. Um, besides, we do disseminate, uh, we disseminate uh, uh, Cochrane reviews to patient, clinicians and decision makers. And we are also part of what is called now the new evidence-based practice school, which is more on not just to write systematic reviews, but also that are part of uh, developing uh, national clinical guidelines, clinical procedures, and also decision aids, as we heard about, uh, which is like the uh, magic app, uh, for instance. We also have a group that work on how to best communicate research results, which is a big problem. Um, in order to use research, we have to communicate it in a way that it is helpful for the persons that are going to act upon the research. And especially when we have research that um, tells us that we do not know, what do we do then? That is a challenge. Um, I also want to add that uh, we... Yeah, like, like Astri told us about, we have uh, the Norwegian Electronic Health Library, which also contributes in disseminating both systematic reviews and, uh, and uh, clinical practice guidelines and so on. And lastly, I would also say that we, we, from, from, I think from the very beginning, or at least from the, uh, from the beginning of the 20th century, we started also to, to teach in evidence-based practice, both for journalists, uh, patients, clinicians, and students. So that was a little bit about uh, the view from the Norwegian Knowledge Center. Hello, everybody. Uh, I think this is really a great day. And congratulations uh, to the committee here for making such an event with so many people talking about knowledge translation. Uh, I think for me, it's um, when we are going to look in the future to look uh, and see what we should do now. I think it's often of interest to look back uh, to see what has happened before. Um, in the middle of the 90s, I was giving a lot of courses about evidence-based practice uh, around uh, the country uh, until I um, realized that my courses did not have any effect or a very, very small effect. It could be only my courses, but uh, after a while I saw in the, the research literature that that type of um, way of changing practice was not uh, uh, showing a great effectiveness. And from that point, I was writing an article about how challenging it is to use research when you are deciding 
um, uh, making decisions in, in, uh, in concrete single patient cases. And I think we have a huge uh, problem. Uh, and I think uh, we are now uh, having two different strategies because we, we also uh, have this knowledge translation strategy, which I uh, experience is a different strategy from evidence-based practice. And uh, I think we need, now we need to, to try to look into these strategies and see when does evidence-based practice uh, as a solution work? Is it when uh, the complexity is lower, uh, the patient's complexity, um, the complexity of the research, and so on. And uh, I think in, in many of um, the cases when we need to put evidence into practice, we need type of more system-orientated strategies. And I believe that knowledge translation is more type of a solution. Uh, that could work in, in that type of matter. And uh, now we have, um, I, I, to talking about the history again, um, we had some meetings in 2007 uh, in Oslo and Stavanger, uh, where we were talking about knowledge translation, and we wanted to start a master course on this topic. And we wanted also to start this organization, which is now called Presenter, Making Sense of Science. And uh, uh, we, we didn't meet anyone that had heard this word, knowledge translation, before in 2007. And finally, this year, we started this master course that we planned in 2007. So uh, we are working a bit slow <laughs> uh, in our team. But uh, the, the course now that we, we had the first round of the course with uh, more than 40 students, uh, and it's organized as an open online course. And uh, it's very interesting because all the students, they um, are getting in the task of planning a knowledge translation project uh, relevant for own practice or own situation. Uh, and I think uh, we need to focus, as I experienced that we have today in this conference, on the tools to, to make skills, um, to, to have um, different type of knowledge translation strategies, knowledge translation interventions uh, to be, um, to, to, to make us, uh, to enable, uh, to, to, to be um, enabled to, to, to make this very huge task of putting evidence into practice. I think we have a very large task. I, I, I'm glad you're optimistic, and, and I'm also sometimes, but I think it's, it's a very, <laughs> very it's, a, it's a large task, and I think we need to discuss more about when uh, does this um, solution work, and when does this solution work, and, and uh, we have also a lot of flaws in the research. And that was the biggest problem in our first course in knowledge translation this year, because it's not, the research is not reliable. And should we then implement uh, research that we couldn't trust, um, that will be even worse than common sense that uh, we use today. So, yeah, so that was more or less what I was saying. Thank you. Um, taking the perspective of the, of the health services, um, I think there's, there's a focus, we need to focus on, uh, on how we do this on a structural level. And at the same time, we need to um, look into how um, this works at the individual level. Um, by this I mean that um, a lot of clinicians um, today have the view that it's their decision what um, treatment the patient should uh, receive. They don't necessarily... Um, think that very explicitly, but it, uh, when you see them uh, in doing the clinical work, they don't necessarily discuss the, the effect of the treatment with the patients and the options, and they do what they've done, been doing for quite a long time. So, so we need to, to focus on uh, how um, we do our work as health professionals. 
uh, we cannot um, link our identity as health professionals to a specific type of intervention or a specific uh, therapy. We need to, um, to uh, we need to train health professionals uh, to understand and also to appreciate that we are constantly changing. Uh, the need for um, new treatments will always be there and we need to, to change um, our practice according with, with new evidence. And I think that's quite challenging. I think it's a, it's a culture shift where we are in a early uh, era for um, era for knowledge translation and implementation science in Norway. Uh, but it's, it's a kind of a, it's a battle that is is, is needed. Uh, we need um, to sh to shift towards evidence-based practice and uh, uh, knowledge summaries, which is based on um, systematic research and not on something a person learned in school or a person learned from another uh, health profession when they, they started working. So that's at the individual level. At the um, organizational or, or um, system, uh, structural level, I mean, um, we need to think about how we do professional development. There's a lot of money in the Norwegian health system being put into professional development. Has it been effective? That's a important question to ask and in many cases without actually having done any research i think from what we know it's it's um it's okay to say that it hasn't been very effective uh and um one thing that wasn't very, very much focused on today but i know that uh, ian graham is is concerned about this issue too is is it um the implementation how do we get rid of the um solutions and the interventions, the knowledge that is not any more functional for us. We need to get rid of them. And how do we do that uh, at the same time as we replace them with, with, with new evidence? So um, at the organizational level, we need, I think, to shift resources from the way that we've been doing professional development today towards more um, basic training for a lot of health professionals in evidence-based practice and implementation. I'm not saying that everyone needs to be equally trained. I'm not saying that everyone shouldn't either, but I'm not saying that we, we, we have to have a certain master degree, everyone, in evidence-based practice. But we need people to respect evidence-based practice and the mechanisms of implementation. And I think the key key way of, of doing that is because uh, health professionals, the, those I know, and I think those who all of you know, they are really concerned about the, the patient. They are they, they really want to do what's best for the patient. So if if uh, we're able to explain that the current practice isn't really working for the patient, this is a better practice, and we could show the result um, of that. That's um, that's something which which health professional will listen to. to. So um, in at our center at Kompetence uh, Tensen, we have um, have set up a project is, that is organised by Jenny, which is focusing po focusing at summarising new knowledge relevant in rehabilitation, but also focusing on how to measure it. What is a relevant outcome measure for an intervention? And by being systematic, both in terms of interventions and how we evaluate and measure them, we will be able to show uh, both to ourselves as health professionals or to the patients which one uh, that are working. Great, thank you guys. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions, so think a little bit about the questions you have. I'm just gonna briefly summarize what I've heard from the panel. It sounds like over the last 20 years or so, there's been a lot of movement actually in Norway to um, work towards more evidence-based practice. Uh, the, the, there have been improvements in perspectives and attitudes towards evidence-based practice and a decrease in barriers, especially related to access to the literature. And um, there have been many contributions in the development of resources and knowledge translation tools, uh, including systematic reviews, decision aids, um, and also education and training in the area of evidence-based practice. 
but I'm also hearing that we do have some gaps, and the gaps are really uh, related to um, implementation and actively learning some of the implementation methods that um, we could use to actively get this uh, information into practice routinely. Um, we, there may also be some um, barriers related to resources and time because these projects do take some time to uh, put together and implement in a systematic way. And we should focus on uh, implementation not just from an individual clinician's perspective, but then also from an organizational uh, perspective and between organizations so we can start to standardize practices throughout the um, health system and health region. So I, I think that you guys have brought forward a lot of really good points. I hope I didn't miss any major points that you guys brought forward. And does anyone have anything to add? No? All right, I would love to hear questions or comments. I know that we're almost out of time. Uh, does anyone have any comments or questions you'd like to bring forward? Oh, yeah. Yes, I agree. And it, just to, to make sure I understand your comment, um, that the knowledge of each of the centers and bringing them together collaboratively to grow and learn from each other and come up with solutions that work for everyone. I, I absolutely agree. That's a really good comment. I believe that uh, some of you know about the implementation framework, uh, which is called Parish. Um, and I think uh, Parish give us some very important message about how to proceed uh, in, in Norway uh, about knowledge translation. It says that successful implementation of, of research into practice uh, need to be uh, facilitated by three aspects. It's um, or I say something, it, it will be interfered by three aspects. It's how good the evidence is, it's uh, how well pre prepared uh, the context is for taking uh, this evidence into practice, and also the third one, how well it is facilitated. And I think uh, that gives us some message about how to proceed. I have a um, question um, regarding the, the relation between uh, shared decision making and uh, medical guidelines. Um, because my, um, my experience is that this, um, from the point of view, of the, from the shared decision making point of view, it um, is my um, experience that medical guidelines often are a barrier to shared decision making. Although both kinds of interventions um, and technologies based on the same 
evidence and, and on the same methods to to search this evidence. But if I try to train uh, doctors who just have learned to to consider medical guidelines, uh, they are not so happy with uh, agreeing in uh, giving the choice to the patient. I think this is something we, we should um, we should work with. So I just want to respond to that comment about guidelines. We need to pay attention to what's going on in the Netherlands because they actually are changing the whole guidelines to be more about informing decision making and having decision aids as end products of guidelines. So I think we can work together, but I completely support your comment because I actually think that they are, they're going back to the paternalistic approach to we'll tell you what you have to do in a guideline. And so many guideline producers are very directive and not engagement of the patient. I, I think we have run out of time, but thank you guys very much. I'm gonna hand it over to Jan to wrap up, but thank you very much for coming today and participating in the conference. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed it. I just, I just want to say two, thing, uh, two things. First of all, thank you to the audience. So a big applause for to the audience. Secondly, spread the word. Bring one of these posters, posters with you and uh, show it to your colleagues. Spread the word. Even though this is not a religious movement, uh, I, I agree, we should still spread the word. Have a great evening. Thank you so much.